Hey everyone! You know, ever since I got rid of that old Unimog 404, I really do feel like I've been a little bit short on old, rusty, neglected Unimogs. So, let's go get another one. So I really feel like I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, but I still don't have the paperwork to make the old McGill Street legal. So we are going to be heading out in the Humvee once again. Now don't get me wrong, I really do like my Humvee, but I would also really like to give the old McGill its chance to shine. However, I may just have some updates on that thing. But we can talk more about that later. This video is about a Unimog, so let's head out. All right, everyone, here it is, a very tired looking former Danish military Unimog 411. So there is really not a whole lot of backstory to this one, or well, there probably is some good backstory from its military life, but I haven't really had a chance to look into that yet. But some guy purchased this from the military auction along with an old Land Rover and a G-Wagon. And from what we can gather, he pretty much just took these three vehicles home, parked them in his hedge, and they just kind of sat there for the next roughly 20 years. And now this one has been picked up and brought out here to Militærbutikken, which translates to the military store. And the guy here, he deals a lot in military surplus as well as auction stuff, and also old vehicles and machinery like this. I'm gonna be leaving a link to his store down in the description if you're curious to know more. And I know that this thing is extremely rough, but Let's just get this thing loaded up and take it home to have a closer look at it, because it honestly looks like it's about to start raining. Again.
All right, here we are. And as usual, when I bring home stuff like this, it's very dark. So we're gonna have to wait till tomorrow to have a closer look at this thing. But lucky for you guys, tomorrow is now. And as I am now seeing this thing in the daylight, I can tell that this cab has collapsed even more on the drive back home because this door was not that badly misaligned when we took off from up there. <laughs> oh man, the whole thing is just breaking off from its mount. So this entire side and corner is just coming down. This cab is extremely rusty. Now some of you probably already know how I feel about doing a ton of rust work, which of course brings the question, why did I even get this? And to be fair, I wasn't going to. I've known for a while that it was up there where we just went to pick it up, but to be honest, I just thought it was a bit too expensive for the condition that it's in. But apparently so did everyone else because it stayed up there for a while. But then sometime last week, I went up there to get something completely unrelated and I got to looking at this thing and we also got to talking about it and then he mentioned his absolute minimum price and I thought, well, darn it, that's actually kind of what I thought it was worth. So I just came up with the offer that if he threw in those other things I went up there to get, I would pay his minimum price for this thing. And uh, he accepted that deal, so here we are. Now, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't even interested in this thing. Of course I am, it's a Unimog. I mean, there's a reason I was up there looking at it in the first place. And also, I have never owned one of these old 411 Unimogs. And the 411 series is really widely considered as the one that really got the whole Unimog thing going. I mean, there was some models before this one, like the 401 and the 2010 and stuff like that, but they were not produced in nearly the same numbers as the 411. And in my mind, this type and this body style, that's the first real Unimog. And this particular one is, in its own way, very interesting, <laughs> at least to me, because this is a former Danish military vehicle you can still sort of make out its old military registration there on the door. And the Danish military did not have very many of these old 411 Unimogs. And a good handful of the ones they did have, they ended up in Greenland where they drove around with big snow blowers on the front. And they had a separate engine up in the back that ran through a drivetrain to power that big blower. But this was not a snow blower vehicle. And I was told that one of the very few things that the guy who bought this off the military auction actually did to it was to take off its crane. It had a little one to two ton crane right here in the middle. And he took it off because he had to use it for something else. But from what I've been told, that crane just ended up laying on the ground next to this thing. And it's been rotting for just as long as the rest of the vehicle. But also on the back of this, it has an enormous hitch. And this looks like the same kind of multi-level hitch that you find on old aircraft tugs. So this thing might have been working at an airport, possibly belong to the Air Force, but I really don't know at this stage. I have not yet been able to find a whole lot on this thing's military history. So I'm really not sure what it was used for. Hopefully we can find out some more about that later on. And of course it is just a crying shame that this thing has been left to rot for so many years. Because I'm told that this really was a perfectly functional vehicle when it was parked back then. And you can sort of tell how little this was used since its initial military auction. Because you can still see the numbers they put on the windshield at that auction back then, roughly 20 years ago. No one ever even bothered to clean those off, so obviously no one has ever really been looking out through that windshield. So this really haven't driven much. And up until its auction back then, this thing has only done just under 30,000 kilometers. But unfortunately, at this point, the entire cab, as well as the entire bed, and a lot of the other thin metal as well, is just a total loss. There's just no repairing this. There's nothing left to weld to. I mean, there's a handful of components all around that are salvageable, but honestly, it is going to need a completely new cab, a new bed, and a bunch of other new parts. And honestly, the only reason I'm even giving this thing a chance is because of the very low kilometers, and also the fact that somehow the entire 
chassis and drive line and all of this stuff underneath actually looks very good. It really hasn't rusted at all. I haven't seen any very bad spots. Even stuff like the backing plates for the brakes, they are all still there and looking good. So honestly, if this thing got some new stuff on the top, it might actually be realistic that this thing gets to drive again. But we are getting way ahead of ourselves here. First, we got to figure out the two things that everyone wants to know. Will it start and will it drive? And that second part, that's really going to take a lot of work. Well, actually, so will the first part, probably, because I haven't even looked at the engine yet. So we got to get all those straps off and get it down and get it to some place where we can have a closer look and see what we've actually got. But first, I got to figure out how to even get this unloaded. The reason we put it up there with the forklift is because the wheels don't turn. Either the brakes are locked up or it's in gear. I can't really move the shifter, so I'm not entirely sure. Could also be both. We'll see. I would really like to see if I can get this thing inside because I think I'm going to need a lot of tools and stuff and I don't really want to drag all of that down into the yard. So we're going to see if we can get it unloaded right here and then somehow either push it or pull it inside. Honestly, don't even know if the old Ford is even capable of just picking up this whole thing like he did with the forklift. But uh, let's just give it a try.
Well, that was much more difficult than I thought it would be. Those wheels are completely locked up. They didn't even try to turn. And by now I am pretty sure that it is in gear. Otherwise that shifter would be pretty much straight up. So I'm pretty sure right now it's in first gear low range. But I can't pull it into neutral because there is tension on the gears themselves inside the transmission. Probably because it was left in gear while it was sitting for all of those years. So now that the wheels are rusted in place, it just can't release the tension on the gears in there. So now I am really hoping that we can get that engine to rock just a little bit, just enough that we can take the tension off those gears and I can pull it into neutral. Because currently, everything is completely locked together. But if we can wiggle that engine just enough to get it into neutral, then we can really start looking at that thing and see if it will do a full revolution. But before I even go that far, this whole cap is collapsing even more now that I've been pushing and pulling on it. And currently the whole thing is just twisting. And I can see the windshield frame is bending and I really don't want that because that's one of the few parts that is actually salvageable along with the windows themselves and this whole top canvas holder. So I really don't want it to collapse completely and twist and destroy all of that stuff. And also, if I do need this cap for some references, it would be nice that it has at least more or less the correct shape. So I think the very first thing I'm going to do is try to push these corners back up to where they should have been. And then I'm just going to weld some braces on this thing just so it can retain its shape for a little bit longer. And another reason I want to do that right away is because currently the entire cab is held up by the engine and the transmission. So if I'm going to be working on these things, I can't really have them holding the cab as well. This corner over here is what has collapsed the most, so it's going to have to come up quite a bit. I think I'm going to try to see if I can lift it with this. This has the most travel. Hmm. This is actually working all right. It's a lot of crunching noises. <laughs> this whole thing is so crunchy. <laughs> oh man. That's close enough. Well, there really wasn't much to weld onto. I was just burning holes in most of this stuff, but uh, this should be enough to have it reasonably secured. And yes, I did also tag weld the door shut because they didn't open anyway. The hinges are completely rusted. So when I tried to open the door, I was just bending the whole thing. So I figured I may as well weld them in place so they can help to hold this whole thing together. It is still a bit wobbly, but it should be able to hold its shape now. And also, it is no longer supported by the engine. <laughs> well, this looks like a piece of that transmission cover that was on there. That was pinched in place by the cat before. I couldn't take it out. But speaking of engine, let's finally have a closer look at this thing so we can see what we got to work with. Wow. Well, I'm gonna be honest, it is not looking very good in here either. <laughs> oh, wow. All right, so first things first. It's not that I haven't wanted to tell you which year this thing was made in, but I just simply didn't know. So far, my best guess was 1960 based on that military registration number. 
But now I can tell you that this is a 1963 model. And the engine that is in these things is a Mercedes OM636. And the good news is that these things have had an unusually long production run. They were put into production in the years right after World War II, and they remained in production all the way up until 1990. And these were used firstly in the Unimox, but later on in other Mercedes vehicles, and then in boats and machinery and stationary applications. So not only are the parts plentiful, but there is also plenty of these engines out there still. And that might just come in handy because this thing really doesn't look very good. Hmm. You know, I actually thought someone had cut this belt, but this doesn't really look like a cut. And really the only reason someone would have cut it would have been to remove some of this stuff, and they haven't done that. Or it would have been to try and turn it, but the belt is still stuck to the pulley down there. So actually I think this thing just snapped on its own over the years. Oh, wow, that actually turns. What about the water pump too? <laughs> okay, that's kind of impressive. That actually gives me a little bit of hope because usually things like this are the first components that would get stuck because they are out here exposed to the elements and unlike the internals of the engine, they are not covered in oil. So the big question now is of course, will this turn? And uh, honestly, <laughs> looking at it right now, uh, I really have my doubts. <laughs> but we are gonna give this an honest try. So first thing, I think I'm gonna remove this radiator because that's gonna make it much easier for me to get onto that crankshaft. And then I think we are gonna pull that valve cover off. I'm gonna blow this whole thing off with some, some air first so we don't have all that crumbly rust falling in there. But I would really like to get the valve cover off just to see if the whole thing looks completely horrible on the inside. And depending on how everything looks before I give it a real try, I might also want to pull out the injectors if I can, or maybe pull off a manifold or something like that so we can spray some oil and stuff into those cylinders before we start to try and turn this thing. Looks like it still has that shutter for the radiator for when you're driving in really cold weather, but uh, it's not supposed to be detachable like this. <laughs> Wow, there's actually a little bit of coolant coming out down here. That's hopeful. Here we go, come on. <laughs> Here we go. There is that nice big bolt I was looking for. Now we have something nice and solid to hold on to. Let's just pop this valve cover off real quick because I'm honestly really curious to see how this thing looks on the inside. Wow. You know, I honestly feared there was gonna be a whole lot of rust from condensation and stuff in there, but this all still looks black and oily. That's a really good sign. Now I'm having slightly higher hopes for this thing. All right, so I thought the next step would be to see if there's even any oil in this thing. 
And I was looking for quite a while to find the dipstick on this. It turns out it's back down here in the corner. I can hardly get to it. You're probably meant to get to this from the inside, but uh, someone welded up the doors, so it's a bit hard to get in there. But uh, you can just see it's right down in there in the corner. So, do I just not know how to do this, or is that dipstick rusted in place? Ah, come on! <laughs> You're supposed to be covered in oil. How do you rust in place? It genuinely looks like that dipstick is rusted into the engine block. <laughs> I don't think we're getting this out. Wow. So we're just going to assume it has some oil in it because it's not greasy in the bottom. So I don't think it's been running out of it. And it does still have a little bit of oil up here, so that looks pretty good. So we're just going to call it good for now. Now the next thing is I was talking about maybe taking out the injectors, but look at this. That is just all rust holding those injectors in place. If I tried to take those out, I am never going to get them back in. So uh, we are going to leave those in there for now. And because everything is looking worse and worse by the minute, I'm not going to do a whole lot more. Let's just try and put some force on that crank to see if we can get this to move even just a little bit. Right, let's see what happens here. Nothing. I'm <laughs> just loosening that bolt. Let's try the other way. Nope. Now I'm just tightening it. Nothing. Oh boy. Let's see if we can get a better hold of this thing. I can't really put a ton of force on it with this tiny chain, but uh, let's just see if we can do something. Nope, I'm just bending stuff. All right, well, with all else failing, I'm gonna have to start getting creative. I don't really have any good way to get onto this pulley out here in the front, so I'm gonna try putting some bolts in here nice and snug, but the problem is that they are just little eight millimeter bolts, so there is a chance I'm just gonna snap them off. This feels like I'm gonna hurt myself. This is really stuck. It's so rusty right in this corner. I might be able to get something onto this pry bar <laughs> right through the front fender. <laughs> All right, now something is going to give, but it's probably just gonna be those little bolts in there. Yeah, they are just bending. Wow. Let's just give it one more try, see if it'll do anything in the other direction. Nope. Well, this thing is just not budging at all. I really was hoping that I would at least be able to rock it back and forth just a tiny bit. Because even if the pistons are stuck inside the cylinders, when there's no oil pressure, there is still a tiny bit of play in between the wrist pins and the big end bearings and that stuff. So even with the pistons stuck, you should still be able to rock this just a tiny bit and feel that play. But I can't even do that, so 
I think something is holding up the crankshaft itself. All right, so now that we know that the wheels are completely locked up and the engine is completely locked up, it's even more of an issue that this thing was left in gear because with nothing turning, I cannot release the tension on those gears in there, so I can't put this thing in neutral. And as long as this whole thing is locked up, everything is holding back everything else from rotating. So before we do a whole lot more to try and get that engine turning, I really would like to try and see if we can do something to get this into neutral. Now, of course, had this been a normal truck, I could have just removed the prop shaft or the drive shaft here, and that would release all that tension in the drive line. Problem is, this is not a normal truck. So the U-joint for that prop shaft is inside this housing here, and that is also the big ball joint that is holding the entire axle in place. So in order to release that, I would have to undo the entire axle and move that whole thing back to get in there. And it's really quite a big job, so I don't really want to do that right now. I don't really think that the problem is the shifter mechanism itself, because the levers do move a little bit but it just feels like there is tension on things in there. I mean, it still has its cover on and there's still grease in here, so it's not rusty on the inside, this assembly here. The only thing I can move right now is the PTO that I can turn on and off. But I guess you never know. Maybe it just needs a little bit of persuasion. Oh, now we got a little bit of sideways movement, but the problem is still the same. It won't pop out of that gear. Yeah, it's definitely binding in there. Don't even know if there's any oil in this thing, but just like the engine, it's not greasy underneath, so I think it's still in there. Come on, is this rusted in place as well? I think this is gonna snap. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, the oil doesn't even look too bad. Well, that's enough for me to think that the transmission is probably all right. We just need to release that tension on it. All right, so as I'm going over my options here, it seems to be either I start to disassemble that transmission and get this whole shifter mechanism out, but I really don't think there's anything wrong with the transmission itself, so I would rather not do that and risk getting a whole bunch of dirt and loose parts and stuff down in there. So the other option is to go back to plan A and try to see if we can get that engine to turn just a little bit. I mean, the tension is only gonna be holding in one way, so we just need to turn things the other way a little bit to hopefully release everything up. Of course, I don't know which way that is, but if we can get it to move, it should really only be able to move one way. Now this whole section right here that covers the starter and comes across over there, that is detachable. So I think I'm gonna to start to take that off and hopefully we can gain access to the flywheel because if we can get to the teeth on that and pry on those instead, we can put a lot more torque on the flywheel than we could on that pulley out there in the front. I'm not entirely sure there is an access port, but if not, we're just gonna pull the starter out and go through that hole. I didn't really anticipate I would have to work so much inside the cab. If I knew, I probably wouldn't have welded the door shut. Maybe we can get access to it right here. It actually looks very rusty and dirty and stuff in there. Maybe there's been water getting down in here. Perhaps the whole flywheel clutch assembly is stuck. Who knows? I think the teeth of the flywheel are all the way in here. Can't really get to that. Hmm. 
All right, let's just go ahead and get this starter out. Wow, this one is so rusty, it just immediately rounded itself. I suppose there's never really a good place for a rounded nut, but this is definitely a bad place for one. Ha! <laughs> oh man. We would have probably had to take this thing off anyway. Look at that. Who wants to bet if this thing works? I'd be pretty impressed. Well, it's pretty hard to film what I'm doing in here because I can't even get in to see it for myself. But I am just sticking a pry bar into that hole where the starter was and I'm just prying on the teeth of the flywheel. If this works, you might be able to see that pulley out there move a little bit. Well, that wasn't really much of a help either, but I was just thinking this clutch housing has a really big opening here in the top and seemingly there are no openings in the bottom. So maybe this entire housing is just filled up with stuff that would have come down through here over the years. So just want to get this cover off and see what's going on down here. Oh no. <laughs> well, suspicions confirmed. There is all sorts of stuff down in here. Oh no, it is just full. Let me give you a closer look at this. <laughs> this might just be our problem. Look at that. I can't even see the shaft. It's right here, but it is just covered in stuff in here. Oh man, I'm not even sure how to get all of this out because like I said, there is no openings in the bottom of this housing. Well, let's start with a vacuum, I guess. There's so much, oh man. It just keeps going. Wow, that's a lot of dirt. I can just keep digging out dirt and stuff around that flywheel in there. Man, that was a lot of dirt. I even had to stop halfway because the vacuum was just full. But to be fair, most of that stuff was probably in there even before this thing was parked for all those years. But the problem is all of that dirt has of course also been holding some moisture. And I can already see that the springs are just falling out of the pressure plate of the clutch because the end caps that should hold them in place are just rusted away. 
So unfortunately, with all that moisture and rust, it may have just been rusting away at the ends where the shaft is coming through. So it may have been getting into the input shaft bearing in the transmission or into the main bearing in the engine. Or maybe it's just rusting the entire flywheel onto the engine block or the face of that in there. Huh. That's really unfortunate. You know, we could just give it one final try because now I can get directly onto the shaft with a big pipe wrench just to see if it will do anything at all out here. Nope. We can fry off this clutch. Ah! Ugh, no, <laughs> it's just crumbling. Oh man, that is really unfortunate. All right, I think we can just go ahead and call it for now. Will it start? No, not even a chance. But the good news is that if our problem is down there in the clutch housing, the engine itself might just be all right. Bad news is that I can't even get to checking that. At this point, in order to get in there and really have a good look at things and loosen everything from each other, I'm gonna have to separate the engine from the transmission. That's a pretty straightforward project, but the thing is, I'm gonna have to also remove what is left of this cab. And I'm not sure it's gonna survive that. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a few parts on here that I would like to take off and save because I do think they are salvageable. But I think we are gonna end this video here because I just really didn't anticipate that it would be such a big project just to try and turn the engine over. And with the state of that clutch in there, there is zero chance that this thing is gonna be driving anytime soon. And I just really don't have that much time to put into this right now. We do still have the little Udemark 421 that we have to finish up along with all the other projects. And to be fair, this particular Unimog is probably best suited as just spare parts, unfortunately. But there's just so much of it that it's just too far gone. And that's also what I had in mind when I bought this thing. It was cheap enough that I figured, if for nothing else, it would at least be worth it in parts. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. As mentioned, the entire undercarriage and all the good stuff underneath, it really does look like it's mostly all right and it doesn't have a whole lot of miles on it. But to get this thing back to life, I'm gonna need like an entire extra Unimog 411 as a donor vehicle just to put stuff onto this one. So I don't really know. <laughs> but if you guys really want to see it, I suppose one day we could go ahead and take this cab off and get that engine out, just to try and see if we can really figure out what exactly the problem is. But thank you all for watching along and I'll see you in the next one.